That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Scream 6, Ghostface Takes Manhattan. Uh, Shout out to Jason Voorhees. Yep, Jason Takes Manhattan. The I think that's the 8th installment of Friday the 13th. That was on my mind the whole time watching this. Uh, this is the fourth film directed by the duo Matt bettinelli Olpin and Tyler Gillette. Uh, previously, they directed Ready or Not, which I know you've seen, uh, as well as Scream, the 2022 film, the requel that is technically Scream 5. Paramount is releasing it March 10th, 2023, and uh, all spoiler reviews have been embargoed until after uh, the weekend after the premiere, which... Um, I mean, that's commendable to uh, protect something that's worthwhile, and this film is not, in my opinion, but there we go. So we watched the previous five films mm -hmm. over the course of like the last three days. Which I've seen all before, and you have not. I had not. So I'm up to speed, so I don't need a whole bunch of comments about how I need to understand this universe to appreciate this film. I, I get the gist of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think if people like the other films, because to me, watching all of them, they all seem very similar. Mm -hmm. It's just like you can tell based on, I guess, Courtney Cox hair and face, what, what decade it is. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But like they all feel very similar. There's an opening kill. Then a bunch of people are getting killed by a man in a mask. And then it's like revealed who the killer is. And in all but one film, there's more than one killer. Mm -hmm. Okay. In this film, it's the same thing. Opening kill. Ghostface killers out here, killing fools, and then we find out who it is. Okay, so Scream 6, the core four from Scream 5. So we have Sam. Played by Melissa Barrera. She's the one who we find out is the daughter of Skeet Ulrich. Billy Loomis. One of the original killers. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's her plus her estranged sister, Jenny Ortega. Mm -hmm. Tara. And then Cuba Gooding Jr.'s son. Chad Mason Gooding. Mm -hmm. And his sister. Mindy, played by Jasmine Savoy Brown. Okay, so those four have left Westboro to go to New York to go to college. Well, except Sam. Sam is just there. Is it Woodsboro? Maybe. It's a fictional town in California, but I don't believe it's the Westboro Baptist <laughs> Church. But I don't want to be it either. Same. Um, they're all there to go to college except Sam. She has just followed her sister to try to protect her. Because it's only like six months after the killings of Scream 5. I think it's... Did they say it's a... Because she's seeing or, a therapist. Or a year. I think it's a year. And she's been seeing a therapist for six months. That's an integral Got it. moment. Got it. So, back on their bullshit, like someone calls Sam talking about, I'm going to kill you in the ghost face voice. And so it all starts back up again. And they're evading being killed. Gail Weathers shows up. We're told Nev Campbell's not coming. She's trying to get her rest. She sends her regards. Is Dewey in it? Dewey died in Scream 5. Oh, see, they all blend together mm -hmm. to me. Um, I mean, it's all the same format. So then who's the killer? There are actually five killers in this movie, but the main, like the ones that last the entire film are the family of Richie. Mm -hmm. who was Sam's boyfriend in Scream 5. Who is Randy one? Quaid's kid. Dennis Quaid's son. Dennis Quaid's Jack kid. Jack Quaid. Mm -hmm. They're mad because they believe Sam and her little gang are responsible for the death of their murderous ass son. So, Dylan McDermott. Dermot Mulroney. And his two kids. Liana Liberato and Jack Champion. The three of them are out here trying to kill everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's it. All right. And of course, they get done up, meaning they're killed. Mm -hmm. And then the core four go on about their business. Although I don't know how this... It makes sense to me that the fictitious film within Scream is called Stab because mm -hmm. people keep getting stabbed in places that, it, to me, seem like it would be curtains. Like, Chad mm -hmm. gets stabbed. Like, there's no way he's alive. And yeah. he's good. Um, Gail Weathers has taken so so much trauma to her body over the course of these six films. <laughs> Including the sixth one, and she's fine. Uh, okay. But anyway, the core four is still alive. Gail Weathers is still alive. Okay. So the film opens with a kill. Mm -hmm. Samara Weaving. Mm -hmm. uh, playing a character named Laura Crane, which I'm assuming, because there's Hitchcock references throughout this whole franchise, so I'm assuming that's... Uh, a, a nod to the sisters Janet Lee and Vera Miles and Psycho, as well as maybe Preminger's Laura. Okay. 
Good to know. So we so the opening scene is her at a fancy restaurant and she's waiting for her date and then she gets a call saying, I can't find you. She gets lured into the most brightly lit alley you've ever seen mm -hmm. in between two highly populated streets when all of a sudden Ghostface pops out and kills her. And then we see the killer. Mm -hmm. Do we know that actor's name? Uh, Tony Revolori, who's in uh, Spider-Man No Way Home. So... We find out that he uh, is gay and his boyfriend, they are two rich homosexuals who are obsessed with the stab film. So they're doing some Leopold and Loeb shit. They have per so they purchased like a like an abandoned theater and they've turned it into a shrine to the ghost face killings. So they have there is so much about this story that's so unbelievable to me. These two homosexuals have purchased all of like the evidence from all the killings. They have all of the ghost face masks from all the killings. They have the knives, clothing, everything. And they want to complete the film that Richie from Scream 5 was trying to make. Which was to kill the Carpenter sisters. But uh, Dylan McDermott finds out about the two gay guys. And so he kills them because he and his family want to be the ones to kill Sam and her people. Mm -hmm. That's it. The only thing we didn't mention is... Mm, what's the little lady's name? Jenny Ortega? No. Uh, the oh. blonde. So, speaking of legacy characters, there's Courtney Cox is returning and they wouldn't pay for Nev Campbell. Or, you know, I kept thinking like her... But her character was, is like an author and works for a women's hotline. So maybe she just can't afford to go to New York. Uh, is how they were thinking. But from Scream 4, Hayden Panettiere... Hayden Panettiere, who I actually think is my favorite part of this movie. She's the best part of this. Yes. I can totally see her turning into like a grand dom of like B movies. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I, I really like her vibe. And she wasn't even doing anything that's over the top no. or campy. She just had I a liked, look on her face. I liked her look, mm -hmm. how she was styled. And she just kind of superseded the trappings of this kind of shitty garbage franchise that I think most of even the OG cast couldn't do. And I want to give a shout out to whoever was responsible for her hair. I didn't like it, but it was well done. So I I'm, thought she looked good. So I, so I appreciated it, but I didn't like it. Um, okay. So, where to begin? So, Sam is seeing a therapist. Henry Zerny, who is a character actor and a ton of stuff, and he's a pretty terrible therapist. <laughs> he is, because she's talking to him being very vague, and he's like, I've been seeing you for a long time, like six months, and we're not making any headway because you won't give me specifics on what you're dealing with. All you were talking about is your sister. I'm worried about you. Tell mm -hmm. me about you. So, Sam basically says, like, well... Like, I end up killing my boyfriend by stabbing him 22 times. And then he was a serial killer. And then I found out my dad's a serial killer. And the therapist just goes like, well, we're done. Well, yeah, because she gets all kind of like Enrique Iglesias. And she's like, I think I like it. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm not equipped to deal with this. <laughs> like, um, well, you're in New York as a therapist. Of course you can do the best part about this movie for me uh, is that it reintroduced me to the song Blow the Whistle by Too Short. Sure. Because it's in a party scene. Yeah, we listened to that on the way home. Which I've now added to my gym playlist. Uh, so I appreciated that. I do. I will. I didn't like this film, but I will say that I think it's better than at least the last three Scream films. Um, oh, and, and shout out back to Hayden. Best thing that happens to Scream since Parker Posey. Par Parker poses in Scream 3? Mm -hmm. She's the best part of that movie. Oh, yeah. Like, that's the <laughs> and only that, reason, those highlights. The reason I would rewatch that movie ever again. Another but. character we didn't mention who's integral is RuPaul's boyfriend from uh, Ruby is Red Hot. AJ and the Queen. Oh, AJ uh, and the Queen. Josh Segarra is Danny, who is the uh, man from across the way that's sleeping with Sam. Who's basically Sam's F buddy. Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, I guess he's a red herring because they... Yeah, he's a red herring for sure. They keep... Okay, another thing, now that I've watched the entire franchise or I'm up to date, this whole idea of like, like the rules of horror and every film they keep talking about that and it's like... That's a staple of it, yeah. I find it kind of tedious and in this film they do keep it to a... Well, there are two kind of big monologues where we, where we get an essence of that, but... Well, and it's stuck mostly on the shoulders of Mindy... Uh, who, of course, is uh, the niece of, uh, what's his name? Jamie J Kennedy. Jamie Kennedy's character, who's the one that kind of established that lore back in the screen. That lady is so annoying. That character. <laughs> Poor thing. I oh, know. she's so annoying. 
I know. I want to like. I want to like the brown lesbian, but I just. She was so annoying, but she has her little monologue where she's talking about who, who might be the killer and all the things. But they, they're all saying the same things now. Like legacy characters are up for grabs too. It, 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 who knows who's gonna die? Because in the and we're beyond a requel now. We're in a, a franchise. And well, like, no. Someone actually says maybe maybe this is a sequel to the requel, and it's like, I mean, go off. I mean, I guess that people like that, but. Okay, another thing I wanted to say is I feel like having watched all of the movies, I do think that as a franchise, it feels a little more clever than other franchises like Saw. Oh, or, sure. You know, like I do commend them trying to put everything together. But what I was thinking after I watched this one last night was that the... I saw on TikTok this lady who said that when she was a kid and her family was poor, her mom would make this like oh, lentil or split pea soup mm -hmm. that would last like four weeks. So it looked like, like like a mound of green clay with carrots sticking out of it and that the mom every night would pour water, boil it, they would eat some of it and it would last four weeks. That's how I feel about these movies. It sounds strangely biblical, but yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, so we get that one thing with Mindy talking about all the rules and then we get Hayden Panettiere who's playing this FBI agent out of the Atlanta field based out office. of Atlanta who's joining the case because she wants to help she's been stalking the Leopold Loeb fools online and they're murdered which instigates her to come to New York that's right of her own accord she has a moment where she's breaking like she actually has this big whiteboard where she has all the killers and she's explaining to us from the different films like who's doing what or the different killings and it just felt kind of like I, because I had watched the other, the previous five, like in short succession in recent history, it, it all made sense to me. But I wonder for a person who just either hasn't watched those movies since they came out, or this is the first time watching a screen movie, I feel like you might be confused. Yeah, well, no? the suspension of disbelief that's required of this means you'd probably have to be brain dead because there are. Some so it doesn't even matter. It just there are so many things that don't make sense in this. Well, let's. So that's great. Dylan McDermott. Dermot Mulroney. So, Dermot Mulroney, who's in a much better serial killer film called Copycat, nineteen ninety five. Oh, shout out to Segovia Weaver. Mm -hmm. And the lady I don't always care for. What's her name? Holly Hunter. Yeah. Um. Okay. So he. The coincidences are like like all the things that have to line up are just unbelievable. So first of all, the core four move from Westboro, Woodboro to New York to go to school. Mm -hmm. So Dylan McDermott is like a detective for the NYPD. Mm -hmm. Okay, then his two kids who are also the killers. The daughter, she's roommates with Sam and Jenny Ortega. Mm -hmm. And then the son, who we know from Avatar... Avatar the Way of Water. And Leah, Liana Liberato's been around for a long while, but it's, it's, I guess she's in teen hell because she's she plays a pedophile's victim in Trust, directed by David Schwimmer. The but Avatar anyway. boy mm -hmm. is Spider. roommates with Cuba Gooding Jr.'s son. Mm -hmm. So it's like, wow. Then Dylan McDermott, he gets the case of Ghostface Killer. So like when Sam gets the phone call and she's attacked and people get killed at a liquor store, he's the detective who gets the case. It's like, wow. Then how did this detective afford, like, is it... Yeah, he's got three kids in college that he's paying for and then doing all these shenanigans in New York. Uh, and, and then what else it doesn't make? He orchestrates, so come to find, he orchestrates the death of his daughter in the apartment. That was wild because he tells us that he orchestrated the murder and replaced her body with, like, another body. Mm-hmm. So he said he's been removed from the case because of that, but he hasn't really, but according to these, these trash ass kids. But then no, none of them ask about her funeral. None of them say like, these two, right. where's Quinn? Where, can where's we Quinn? Uh, what are the when, services when's for Quinn? Quinn's services? Yeah, th these girls don't even ask about it. Okay. The detective also tells us that Hayden Panettiere mm -hmm. is, he tells the audience and the core four, oh, she's crazy. She was fired from the Bureau two months prior. But then we find out that's not true. So another red herring. Because that's at like the last 15 minutes. So we're like, oh my God. He, what's her character's name? Kirby? Kirby. Oh, Kirby's the killer. Which wouldn't have made sense. And and she's not. Well, she's just a short little thing. And Well, all of the ghost face killers who end up being superhuman apparently once they put this glitter cape on and this mask that I'm so tired of looking Something at. Something else I hate is how flagrant... 
the ghost face killings are. Mm -hmm. These fools in every movie, in broad daylight, in someone's front yard, in a populated alley. In a subway this In a time. subway. Like in this movie, it's just like unbelievable. There's a scene where Ghostface has gone to Sam and Jenny Ortega's apartment with other people in it. Broken in, starts killing fools. That's the moment where we think Dylan McDermott's daughter's been killed, but it was faked. And he is pounding, like causing a loud ruckus in this apartment for a long amount of time. And I just don't understand, like, do they think they're not going to get caught? Is no one going to, like, assist in these murders? Like, it, it's just unbelievable how long the killer just... Because there's another scene when Gail Weathers gets attacked and they're in this luxury penthouse. Let's talk about that. So Gail Weathers is like living like an old spider in this luxurious <laughs> penthouse in the Upper East Side that just happens to be in the same city where all these other things are happening. Yeah, she has this multi-million dollar penthouse in the Upper East Side in the same city that the core four are in being attacked. And then she's like living with some... You know, man, good. He this this black man who's all muscle bound, and they make a comment to be like, not even his muscles could save you. And she's like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> How did the killers get in? Because we find out the killers are the two kids. How did they get into this luxury building? How did uh, the other kids who show up get in? How did no one hear? Because in that scene where she's attacked, there are multiple gunshots over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. I just it's too flagrant for something that's not supernatural. And watching these all kind of in. Back to back is like so many scenes up and down stairs and people falling. Like all of these people need to see a chiropractor that have survived any of these things. Uh, but all of the tossing things in front of the ghost face killer. <laughs> I don't know. It's just. So the detective, mm. you know, until we find out he's responsible for the killings, he keeps saying, oh, at every murder, there was a mask that was left. Mm -hmm. And we ran the DNA and this mask belonged to. Skeet Ulrich or the guy from Scream 4 or the guy from Scream 3. And it, that was just so unbelievable. I mean, when we find out he's the killer and he had access to the masks, it makes sense. But as you're watching it, it's like, this shit is crazy. And also, why don't the core four have police protection? We know that everyone who's sort of in their orbit is being killed off. Why aren't these kids locked up in like a jail somewhere with police protection? It's a, and then the whole because Gail gets murdered or almost murdered uh, and she has access to this theater that the gay guys owns that ends up being a, a trap and they all decide to rub, ride the subway together to go there and of course get separated and yet are also leery of the new people. Right. Like, okay, can we talk about that? And I'm going to start with Scream 5. Y'all can't afford a taxi? In Scream 5, they're all paranoid about who they can trust and who's... But then they have this big house party where they still get done up. And then in this one, they keep talking about who can we trust, who can we not trust. Well, you already have people around you you don't know that well mm -hmm. who end up being the killers. Uh -huh. Then you have RuPaul's boyfriend. Like, he's just Sam's, like, F buddy. Mm -hmm. And I was it was so unbelievable how invested that character was in her. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, and then there's that scene where he helps save them by, why does this man have a ladder in a New York apartment, just there. What, what, I mean, Because yeah. it's orchestrated so that these girls can climb across the courtyard of this apartment complex to go into Well, apartment. speaking of that scene, when they realize they're being attacked, Sam is trying to find a weapon and she goes to get a knife and doesn't, and then it looks like the knives were all taken, which of course we find out was probably Quinn hiding them because she's the killer. Okay, why aren't these fools armed? Because was it the last movie where old girl had the stun guns? Uh, Dylan Minnette had a stun gun, yeah. Why don't, if they know they're being attacked, followed, stalked, they've already been, like, someone has tried to kill these people multiple, why don't they carry protection? Mm -hmm. Why does Courtney Cox not have a gun right next to, like, you know they're off on a mission in Central Park or whatever to find this guy, and you... We, they should know by now. They should know by now. When I Gail know. Weathers first pops up, you know, she's like, hey, Gail Weathers. And she's we're trying to report. And then Sam tries to punch her, which is a callback to Scream 5. I think she gets punched in the first Scream. Or first. And then, but Gail Weathers knows to duck. So then she gets punched by Jenny Ortega. Mm -hmm. I thought that was kind of funny. 
Sure. I, I actually, Melissa Barrera and Jenny Ortega are fine. Uh, Jenny Ortega's so little, and then she has a romantic situation ship with uh, Chad. That does not work. That looks so creepy because that man is, and I know there are couples out there who whose size are very different, sizes are very different, but I don't know. For some reason, those two, she looks like a little girl. She does. And she's so tiny, and then that man is so big. And, and he looks a little older, I think, And than he looks more elderly than his stated age. Mm-hmm. There's no way his character that, I mean that man has to be over thirty. Speaking of elderly, the D H Skeet Ulrich. We need to talk about that, because they have Skeet Ulrich in this movie as like again. Oh, he was in Scream Five. Mm-hmm. That's right. They have him in this one again, looking a little even a little bit older, and he's supposed to be the vision that Sam sees. That's kind of like her schizophrenia. Yeah. Because she's a bad seed. I don't understand if they're trying to because they have him styled like when he was. In, in the that, movie. In 1996, yeah. So that, like 25 years. With that years. stringy part, yeah. But he looks older. So I guess we were talking like, okay, so she didn't, so she, is her memory of her dad from back then? The pictures of how old he the was pictures, when he died? But then he's aged. Mm-hmm. So I almost feel like they should have de-aged him and made it look kind of grainy and cloudy. I think they did try to de-age him. It, it's not working. It's not work. I think... She, he, it's a vision it's a hallucination she's having so they could have made him look like whatever the point I'm trying to make is he looks crazy it, and then sticking with that theme I don't understand why in this film Scream 6 it almost feels like they're trying to make the audience feel like maybe Sam's the killer because we see on social media Sam has gone viral because everyone thinks that she's responsible for the killings in Scream 5 mm-hmm. so she's being harassed but then we find out that It was a rumor perpetuated by one of Dylan McDermott's kids. Okay. But as the audience, we know she didn't kill those people in Scream 5. Mm -hmm. So I just don't understand. Like, like it's written in a way that I felt like, but we know that it's not her. So are, like, are you setting it up so maybe in the next Scream movie she will be a killer? But then in the end, she says, I'm not a killer. And then she has her dad's mask. Which we think, because she's kind of hiding it, like she's going to keep it. And the final scene is she throws the mask on the ground. Mm -hmm. But I think that's supposed to set up that should this franchise continue, which it probably will, she will be exploring her her broken psyche and she will eventually be uh, a villain. Just like... The, the arc for Sydney was always like, is she a survivor or is she a victim? What you're saying makes sense to me, but I just think the way it's presented is like, it was kind of like... It's just not compelling. It's not compelling. Like, we know you're not responsible. So what are you trying to say? Like, is she a killer? Because the killing she's doing is in self-defense. Mm-hmm. So I feel like there's an odd leap that is trying to be made that I just didn't appreciate. Mm-hmm. The subway scene. You already alluded to it, but it was just so tedious. Like, we're on... Because it's Halloween night. So there are a lot... Because we're told the, the ghost face killer mask has sold out. So there are a lot of people on the subway wearing the mask. So, of course... Also, why is somebody still manufacturing these things after... Or why is it not illegal? Right. I, I don't understand how that hasn't become... Like, there, there's still a toy company making these things? It's like before COVID, you couldn't walk into a bank with a mask on. Right. You can't so walk around with toy guns. So, so I, I don't know why... But whatever, it, it just... And it, there's that subway scene in Joker, which is, uh, to me, it feels like it's kind of ripping off where everybody's wearing that same regalia, but... I don't have any other notes. I mean, I'm not trying to shit on this movie. It wasn't yeah. for me, but I think I also watched all six in short succession, and they all feel very similar. They all have the exact same <laughs> format, and it just feels like they are really trying to make something... It's almost like they need to just move on from these core characters... Which I think is probably why you like this one the most. I think I do too because I, th- I find Gail Weathers and Sydney and Dewey. Dewey so cornball Collins. Like there's nowhere to go. They've, they've been backed so far into a corner. It's the, the fresh blood was nice. I do like Dermot Mulroney quite a bit. And I think he had, had some gravitas too. He was kind of campy. Like he was hamming it up. He was, but I kind of, again, that's the only thing this kind of stuff is good for. So I think, especially for the first 45 minutes, I was like, oh, I, I, even though there's a lot of plot holes, I like this more than three, four, five. I agree. Uh, but, but then of course it, it's shackled to the chains uh, of this franchise where we have to, I will say I liked that these killers actually, 
their motives were a little more believable, but the, these stupid people that just want to keep copycatting sure. s- several iterations of people that were never successful in the first place. But I think if you like the other screen movies, you will like this one. Sure. I, um, I, again, I, I uh, echo that it, it's not a franchise that's not for me, and I am a Wes Craven fan. This is No People Under the Stairs. Uh, what would you give it? Two. I would give it two out of five. I didn't care for it. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> But I can see people really liking sure. it. Sure. Anything else? Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>